are times when I come to you and I, I pray with you. Other times, all the time, I pray before I come out here. But today specifically, I'm, I'm really asking God to help all of us um, take this in. It's, there's enough stuff here that I don't want to hear somebody say they, they, didn't, they didn't walk away overfed today because there's it's a pretty big, I think, a pretty big meal. Um, having said that, we're going to do something interesting to get this started. Boy, some of you are going to hate me. Words have meanings, report of meanings. We use them, and if we're not clear about what we're trying to say, they can take on other meanings. For example, word association, if I say the word wait, uh, I better spell that for you. Uh, so we're speaking of this kind of wait. If I say wait, the word wait, your mind is now raced all over the place. And some of you will come up thinking word association, hmm, scale, fat, poundage, maybe. That's the interesting thing about the diversity in our English language. There are concepts, we, we've said this before, but there are concepts even to this word that if not properly understood, we will carry other meanings. I'm using this as an example because, gosh, some of you are going to say, how could, she, how could she do this? I may lose a few of you at the beginning, but I guarantee if you'll stay around, you'll get the whole sum total. Wait, and I'm going to, I'll put in the brackets a second word afterwards, but wait can convey um, a myriad number of meanings. We can speak about weight as in stepping on the scale. We can speak of weight as in a dumbbell. Uh, we could speak of weight as in one throwing around their weight influence. Weight can also carry the connotation of burden. So, of course, why I said I had to write the other word, because if not clearly understood, you may have thought I was saying wait, W-A-I-T, instead of E-I-G-H-T. Now, what happens if I put this word in here? Weight loss. <laughs> now, is there a little clearer picture coming into focus? Your mind immediately races to, I don't know, if maybe for women it's bikinis or the beach. And for you men, it's a little, that, is it that imagery? Another notch there in the belt will be okay. <laughs> but I'm not speaking of that type of weight loss. So why I, I think I'm going to use this as my working title, weight loss, <laughs> for this message. And underneath you can, you can put our cares versus his cares. Now, why I started there, because the nature of the English language, we may find ourselves looking at words, and if not properly understood, they will carry and convey other meanings. So, the text I'm going to use today, uh, 1 Peter 5, 7. What a great way to start a message, making you focus on weight loss. And you'll say, what does this have to do with this message? Everything. Casting all your care upon him. Semicolon there. For he careth for you. I'm using the King James right now. So let me say a few things why I established this at the beginning. At first glance, it would be very easy to look at your care and God's care and say, well, for English speakers and English readers, care is care. But I will show you why this is the reason why I do what I do with the language. But not only that, I wish to communicate some very profound truths that as we've gone through 1 Peter, 
it seems like this particular verse, rightly understood and rightly translated, as I, I, I meditated and reflected on what this means to me, I envision, uh, you've seen Olympic pole vaulting. The pole vaulter has the pole. They're looking at that target they have to get over. They must run a certain distance before they can put that pole in a certain place to get themselves over the pole, and they must clear the pole. This epistle, five chapters, this to me is like the running. We've ran for, for almost five chapters to get to the point of crossing over a bar. With proper understanding, this one verse basically is like the pole being put into the ground that lets you get over, rightly understood. So words will be extremely important. I want to give some backdrop. I don't want to review the whole book, but just some backdrop and some general statements about the first epistle of Peter, which we would be, uh, I, would, I would be remiss to say we've, we've gone through many verse by verse. Some were verses and clusters, but through all, it is clear this writing to a persecuted church, to suffering people, very, very timely, in fact, timeless, because the messages in here don't think it's strange that this is happening to you, that the trying of your faith, I could keep going, but it seems every single chapter possesses the focus to say suffering, trials, tribulations are part of the trip and this encouragement given by Peter writing to his flock, and I am now taking this message today and saying the same thing. It's a common thing. Don't think it a strange thing. If something happens to you along the way in this faith journey that somehow someone should say, this isn't part of the trip. Peter's message is very encouraging. And some will say, well, it's downright depressing. Well, maybe for you, not for me. It lets me know I'm, I'm in God's plan. Um, an interesting quote I wrote down here from Hudson Taylor regarding this particular passage. He says, let us give up our work, our plans, ourselves, and our lives, our loved ones, our influence, all our right into God's hand. And then when we have given it all over to him, there will be nothing left for us to be troubled about. And that sounds quite easy to say, especially for those of us who uh, insist on talking about the proverbial uh, idiom of, of crossing the bridge. You know, we'll, we'll, when we get there, you know, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we, you've heard that idiom before, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Some of us spend a whole lifetime worrying about crossing the bridge, and guess what? The bridge never appears. <laughs> Somebody said, if you want to break down your life's cares and anxieties, 40% of what you spend your time fussing over will never happen. 40%. And by the way, this is an unknown source, and I'm sure they wanted to leave it that way, just in case. But 40% of our anxieties, of our issues, of our troubles are over things that will never happen. 30% are things that are having to do with our past that we can do nothing about. Some people just spend their time fussing about yesterday's events or last week or the, their big mess up that happened in their life, you know, 10 years ago when they fell flat on their face and everybody saw it. And they spend their whole, the rest of their life, 30% of their time is spent in that anxious anxiety of the past. 12% criticism of others, the critics you will have with you always. 10% we spend getting anxious care and trouble over our health, which produces stress, which actually makes your health worse. And 8% of our real anxieties are problems we will really have to face. You know, I could say, all right, amen, let's, we're done now. It's, you know, it's, it's all taken care of. But I want you to see how significant this is in light of A, properly translating this verse, and to help us, no matter how much faith we have generated in our lives through the Word, through latching on to Him every single day, 
in this congregation, in every congregation, but I'm speaking to you as my flock, as the under shepherd here, there's a syndrome of thinking about things to the point of anxiety over the top. So I first decided what I would do here is I'm going to lay some groundwork because I guarantee you when I'm done, you'll see that our cares and his cares are radically different. And the wonder of it all is there's some really clear instruction if we're ready to take it that paints a very clear picture from a man who had, by the way, his own experiences speaking out of first-hand knowledge. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Now, I will go to the Greek, and I'm also going to need to tell you a small uh, lesson on the hows and the whys here, but let's start with the Greek. I want to circle two words first. We'll do the whole translation, but I want to circle two words to demonstrate first the word for care, that is, your care. This is your care right here. Let's get a different color. This is your care right here, and this is his care right here. So first let me talk about his care. That word looks like melee, kind of. Um, his care. His care is used sometimes, that word, let's write it phonetically here. Whoops. All right, I was going to write Greek, and then I decided to write English. All right. Sometimes used, most of the time used, of God's care for the poor, for the downcast. And the other times used of, of a shepherd, the care of a tender, caring shepherd towards his flock. That is the care we're speaking of when we speak of his care, his care to us. He sees us in our true state. This is the greatest thing that's happened to me as I've been reading this, is it really forces you to take a look at yourself. He sees me in my truest state. He sees me when I'm phony baloning myself and trying to say it's okay or doing the stiff upper lip act and saying, okay, it's okay, God. He sees everything. He sees the good, the bad, and yes, the ugly. So when I say this word is sometimes used for his care of the poor, I'm not just speaking of those who do not have intangible, but blessed are the poor in spirit. I would say those who are low and downcast in society, not just not having, not having tangibles, but not having inside, being destitute inside, downcast, and he, his care, he is the chief shepherd. So I want you to take note, that's, that's one side, that's his care. Let's look at your care and my care, because this is a really good and important word right here, this meri menan, which I think you will really see. I've got a good definition of this word, which I don't want to miss out on, because I think it really does well. We would do well to translate this word anxiety. That's number one. And number two, it is that which divides and distracts the soul, which can divert us from the walk of faith. Let me say that again. It is that which distracts and diverts the soul. If you trace the etymological root of this Greek word, it has at, at its root division, dividing the soul. In other words, the inability for us to solely focus on him because we are divided with our anxieties. And why this is super important is because when put in proper framework, you begin to see that he, God, is never anxious about our anxieties. And in fact, um, looking at the two different cares, and you look back at the English and you say, wow, that's lacking some. It gives me a great perspective on 
the rest of what is yet to follow. Now, before I go further in the Greek, and we're going to hold this thought, I want you to look at your King James and have you note that at the very end of verse 6, that he may exalt you in due time. If you're reading from the King James, you should have, right after due time, you should have a colon right there. Show me hands. You should have that in your Bible. And a semicolon after casting all your care upon him. Semicolon. All right. These are extremely important punctuations. And important, I could have just read right over this. I went, you, some of you remember, I once did a message just on a comma in one verse, and it was like, oh, somebody said, really? And I said, yes, it makes a difference. But this actually is highly important. I'd, I'd ask you to just make some notes on this. Um, first of all, it's noteworthy to say that when Peter was writing, there were no visible punctuations in the Greek language. Perhaps a dot at the top of a letter ending a sentence, perhaps. But punctuation was standardized in the middle of the 17th century for the English language. So that draws my attention to why there is that colon right there, that he may exalt you in due time. And the reason being, very simply, there was no chapter and verse either. We know that the verse division was done by Robert Stephanus in 1551. The chapter division uh, at an earlier time by Langton, perhaps somewhere in the 1200. He died in 1228, so before 1228. But the punctuation in the English language came into being around the 1400s. And it was not yet perfected. It wasn't clear what these things meant until now. I'm really want, I'm wanting you to pay attention to this, that he may exalt you in due time, colon, is doing two things. It's telling us that what follows is, is a quote, although it is not truly a quote of Psalm 55, Psalm 55 and verse 22. It's not fully. We don't have it as written. But it is definitely Peter, in his own words, quoting Psalm 55. So we have the colon there for that reason. We also have an as follows. That is to say, this is a compound thought that is being elaborated. So to just lift this verse would do injustice to the text because something comes before and after that are joining forces to give the whole picture. We spoke on, I spoke on humility last week. So if you understand this is going right into my verse this week, it would be noteworthy to say that what leads us to being able to cast all of our care upon him is the fact that we are to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, to render ourselves essentially wholly dependent on him. Wholly dependent on him. Casting your care upon him. For he careth for you. This all seems very easy, but as you move through this, you begin to realize that Peter was saying something even more striking than just highlighting the verse. That something incredible is going to go on, not just the suffering and the persecution, but if you will, if you will submit yourself under God's hand, yes, he will exalt you in due time, and the whole dependence of your nature, of your being, of your existence on him not only means you present yourself, you also present your anxieties, your troubles, your issues. Something Peter does that is not in Psalm 55. Psalm 55 sounds like this, but not quite. He adds something at the very beginning. Pasen, that Greek word, for all. I love the fact that although this is a sentence as a part of another sentence, not joined by a conjunction, the beginning of this thought begins with all, not some of your anxiety, not a little bit, all of it. This is a hard lesson. The text seems rather simple, but it's a hard lesson. 
Do you realize we do spend most of our time, I want you to reflect on your week, we do spend most of our time obsessing about things that we may not want to obsess about them, but they keep coming back in our minds. For some of us, it may be, I've got to pay my rent, I've, I've got to get car insurance, I've got to get food on my table. I've, it, for each person it may, but there is this which flows over us and somehow takes over our mind, and that is why a right understanding of this word, cares, will lead some great clarity. This word for cares, the Greek word, appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Jesus uses it, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in the parable of the sower. It's subtle, so you, it seems so simple, you may miss this. In the parable of the sower, four dimensions of, or pictures, if you will, of how the seed may be received or not received. And the one speaking of where there is thorns, he says, those hear the word, and then cares, the cares, same, our same Greek word, cares, riches, and pleasures of this life essentially choke and kill the ability for the word to grow. I chose Luke's gospel to quote that because he uses the most. He says, same Greek word, same Greek word for anxiety, or, or it is anxiety. So cares, King James, cares, riches, and pleasures of this life. And if you would kind of put a capstone on that, those anxieties are what, as a culture, we spend most of our time fussing over. Jesus, later in Matthew, I'm sorry, earlier in Matthew 6, and I want you to turn there, because I'm going to have you circle words that are exactly this word in the Greek, the same word, merimnan, in Matthew 6, Every time you read, take no thought, what is really being said, this is the Greek word as it will appear, so you can see it is definitely a cognate of the word in our text, just the ending is different. Same word, every time Jesus says, take no thought, don't be anxious. Words from Jesus to us today. No man can serve, at verse 24, no man can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one or love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought. There's your word. Every time it says take no thought, no thought is not don't think about it, like the, it's actually don't be anxious about it. Don't. I don't really want to use the word fret. Don't get caught up in the anxiety of thinking, how? Take no thought for your life. What you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body. What shall you put on? You know, how could we live in our society and live by what, what is being proposed here? Is not the life more than me? and the body more than raiment. Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Here again, watch the word. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto a stature? Which of you, being anxious with anxiety, can add to your stature? It's kind of ridiculous. And why take ye thought? There it is again, same word. For raiment, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? There's one more here. Actually, there's, there's three more. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth the 
but you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, which has, has been my message for this church. It's been the scripture I've taken the most to my heart. Seek first the kingdom of God, all these other things. If you put him first, if you're earnestly seeking after him, he will take care of you and yours. He, we, we read the scripture many times. I've never seen the righteous begging for bread. He'll take care of you and yours. You put him first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought. Don't be anxious for the morrow, for tomorrow. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. Next time some of you wake up in the morning and say, oh gosh, tomorrow, I just, you know, Tomorrow is so many hours away. Go back to the scripture and hear the words of your master saying, don't be anxious for tomorrow. <laughs> Easy for you to say. Well, I didn't say it. <laughs> I have a saving card here. For the morrow shall take thought. Again, there's your word both times for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I want you to see Jesus concern is not for us. Essentially, he's saying, don't be anxious. If you put me first, I'll take care of you. This is a message that has been so caricatured by many evangelists and pastors trying to uh, fleece the saints for something other than getting you to focus in the right place. And if your focus is right, he says he'll take care of everything else. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is to give you re the real padding under this word anxiety, because it always comes back to the cares of this world, the anxieties of this world, the cares of riches and the cares of pleasure. I'm not saying that you shouldn't live. I'm just telling you the instructions are don't be anxious about it. Tomorrow's going to come. Don't worry. God set up the sun and the moon just right. Tomorrow will come. So why are you being anxious about it? Now, yeah, like, like mine, I just, I had to laugh myself when I thought about that the first time. But let me tell you why I'm also doing this, because the same mindset that caricatures translating words, and you might say, well, are, are we here for a language lesson? The answer is yes. Right now, yes. I want to show you, rightly understanding these words lets you know that there are some poor, silly people out there, and I, forgive me, I'm, you know, I'm just going to say it like it is, Turn to Matthew 10, who haven't yet understood what this word actually means. The Greek word I've translated, merimnau. And when they read this, they have their own interpretation. But when they deliver you up, take no thought of how or what you shall speak. But that gives license to say, well, I don't, I don't have to do anything. I just stand there and open my mouth and Take no thought. That's right. Most of them won't think. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that. It means don't be anxious about how or what you, changes the whole frame of reference. When somebody says, don't take any thought. The Lord will provide the words for you. That may be true, but that's not what that's saying. You know how many people I've encountered say, you prepare all that work during the week for one hour? Yes. I'm prepared that I've done all my preparing and the Lord can go, whoosh, not that. <laughs> then I'll grumble about it for a little while, but I'll be obedient to it. I've, I've done that in front of you before. But that's not what that's saying. That is the doctrine of, well, you don't have to think. Well, that's right. There's a lot of non-thinking preachers out there. I'm telling you, don't be anxious of how or what you shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. If you're not anxious about it, if you're not having anxiety about it, and you're trusting the Lord, the Lord will give you the words. But it doesn't substitute, at least not for your pastor and not for you, the act of being in the word. Now, that was just a sidebar, a gratuitous sidebar. Now, let's get back to my text. So some of you will have to spin back to 1 Peter again. So I've given you the backdrop for the full impact of this word, which the King James translated care. And I'm telling you the better word, anxiety. And I want you to take note of something else. These are all small details. 
But this word right here for anxiety is a noun in the accusative, feminine, all you men are going to have fun with that, <laughs> and singular. Now, why it's singular, is a, there's a reason for this. It's singular because it's going to be connected with the concept of what the King James has translated, cast. We're going to review all this and put it together. I'm giving you the pieces, and then we're going to fit them all together in order. So the anxiety we speak of is singular, and all being this whole package. But the real word I want to, I want to introduce to you in the Greek is this word here. It's a compound, epi and rifantes, which is being translated cast. And I would like you also to take note, it doesn't say lay your care or place your care, but this word is why I use the imagery of the pole vaulter, because this word in the Greek carries with it a thrusting. It is an active word to throw or to thrust upon. That has some energy to it that I'm thinking, this is not for the ones that, you know, they just maybe want to just, you know, they want to do this and then they want to run away. This is a full force of casting or throwing in an activity that is very energized. This word, this Greek word, is used in one other place in the scriptures, in Luke's gospel, where when Jesus told them to go get a colt, a young ass, and they'd find where it was, that he, could, he would ride into his triumphant em entry into Jerusalem, they, same Greek word, they threw their clothes upon the beast of burden. They threw their garments, they thrust them onto the beast of burden that Jesus would sit on. That, that picture connected in my mind that we too are thrusting onto the great burden bearer. This is not some uh, possibility message. This is a great action. And when I use the imagery of the pole vaulter, it is because the run that comes up to that point where you would actually do the activity, that's your, your walk, your leap of faith. But the actual activity of thrusting to move somewhere. And then, here's the beautiful thing. Here comes the grammar. This activity, it's, we'll call it uh, for lack of, it's not quite a verb, so we're going we're gonna to use it as a participle. And here, aorist active. That simply means this act of thrusting or throwing onto is an act done once, and it's passed, actively by you and passed. Now, let me explain what that means. To be clear, it's the mistake we all do. How many of you had those midnight hour experiences where you've got something brewing inside, you take it to God, and you think you've left it there, but you really haven't? And then suddenly you find that tomorrow, that same thing that you prayed about, that, that God would fix, you're still, you're still, it's still turning inside. It's like my um, forgiveness message where we go back to the garbage and we, we take some back and we take it back with us. This is why this hourist active is important. The activity is to thrust it upon him and to leave it with him. Oh boy, that's a big challenge. Because, you know, we're all good at the thrusting part. We, know, we all know how to throw things. <laughs> but the leaving it, the committing it with him, this is so, this whole verse renders me with a new force to go and see not only the translation, but what it means for me and for you in our daily walk. The reality is you're not going to have this nice baggage that you gather up and you say, okay, whoosh, now there's no more baggage. You're just going to go and get some more until your back's, you know, weighed down again, and then here comes the next batch, and you leave it. Now, you may understand why I said weight loss, because the weight, the anxiety we carry around, somebody's going to see that and say, oh, Pastor Scott's teaching on how to lose weight. <laughs> yes. 
throw your anxieties upon him. The scripture says the Lord laid upon him the iniquities of us all. So why do we say it's sufficient for our sins, but it's not sufficient for our anxieties? Same thing. Now, the relevance in all this is what's staggering. Let's keep reading. Upon him. Upon him. All the anxiety, singular, and I've explained why, of you having thrown upon him. I ask you how many times, I've done it too, so I'm not pointing fingers at you, I'm guilty of it too. How many times have you not gone to God first? Please don't show me your hands, because if we have to raise hands, I'm going to have to sit down and hold up my feet too. Now, I've said this before, but it really came, it came home for me this way. Delicately, let me say this to you, because I'm telling you, you must take your, your anxiety, your weight, your burden, you must take it to him. Cast it upon him and let every person, family, friend, spouse, be subordinate to that first act of obedience. And let me tell you why. It's hugely important. Let's reduce this down now to the flesh activity so you can get a real, this is the real life of your pastor. It's difficult for me to understand why Person A, we'll just leave it at that, did not come to me and tell me, or at least get the message to me, that they have some terrible issue that they're not only dealing with and trying to fade through, but they can't solve the problem by themselves. They've been praying, but they won't come to me. I have to find out by somebody else. And then I'm sitting and praying and thinking to myself, God, this is my conversation. God, this person either must think that I don't care or maybe the rationale is, well, Pastor Scott's too busy, so I won't bother her. But just in the flesh, as a person who cares, it greatly disturbed me that person A wouldn't come to me and tell me, as their pastor, that I could pray, that I might be able to help in some capacity. It really bothered me. And then it hit me. Well, if I'm that bothered in the flesh, can you imagine what God feels like when you don't go to him first and you ignore him and go to your spouse or your friends or whoever it is and now you are bringing your burdens to them, which we seem to love to do. But can you imagine how God feels? I, I really want you to think about this because this is the one thing that really, it just illuminated my mind. I've been so guilty of this for years and years of going to people. You call a friend, right? Dwayne, you call a friend, you say, oh, God, you never believe what happened to me. Oh, tell, you, tell you, the job was just tough, right? But did you talk to God? And I'm not singling you out now, but you just have me my field of vision. Did you talk to God about it first? Not only because you ought to, but I want you to think about how he sees you when you don't come to him first, like somehow... It reduces down your frame of what you think God is able to do in your life. You either don't believe that he's listening. Now, I'm going to anthropomorphize a little bit, so forgive. I know that a lot of times in my neglect to do just that, I think, gosh, thank God for his grace. God, forgive me for not doing what I'm supposed to do, because the next time that it, this circumstance happens and I'm busy doing, playing phone a friend and tell everybody else, I think God must be thinking, really, and now you want me to help you? Why didn't you come to me first? You call yourself daughter? Why didn't you come to me first? Think about that. Let that settle in. So this scripture is not just a fabulous admonition and instruction. It's also lights on for some of us that should really grab hold of this because when we cast our, thrust our anxieties upon him, the great burden bearer, he is able 
if we'll leave it with him, he's able to solve the problem. He is able, by the way, while before you go to bed at night and you have this disruptive sleep because your mind can't shut down, because you're so obsessed about whatever it is. I've said to you before, bring it to him before you go to bed. He'll be up all night watching for you while you sleep. Now, you first have to believe that, by the way. And why? Hoti, because to him, and I use this word, his care, which is different than our care, his care to the poor, his care to the downcast, his care as the great shepherd watching his stupid, silly sheep. Yes, I emphasize those adjectives. And it felt good, too. <laughs> he cares concerning you. He cares. Not just he cares like I care for you. The care to the poor, the care to the downcast, the care to the vulnerable, incapable of doing it yourself, cares for you. It matters to him. And I think we sometimes succumb to this idea that somehow, either, again, I'll use the analogy, God is too busy to bother with me. He cares for you. You know, in Christianity, this great scripture of John 3, 16, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. No one ever personalizes that. And instead of saying God so loved the world, scratch out the world and put your name there and recognize he cares for you. He went and died on a cross for you. He cares for you when you pray and you ask him in faith, nothing wavering. It matters to him. It matters that his children come to him. Now, let me tell you why this is so radically important to attach to the verse that came before and the verse that comes after. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, if you are not thrusting your anxieties upon him, this pleases the devil greatly, a distracted saint, divided with the anxiety, still walking around with the burden, is a great target, easy prey, real easy to take down, by the way. You see, you need and I need all the power that God will grant to keep my mind stayed on Him with the express purpose of understanding that spiritual warfare requires 110% of my attention and if I'm so wrapped up in my earthly anxieties, how can I fight with what weaponry when my mind is divided about where the fight is? Am I going to be fighting my anxieties or am I going to be fighting these principalities that I cannot see that are around me, hosts around me? Oh, Satan is well pleased, by the way. If, you'll just, if you just hang on to your anxieties a little while longer, it pleases him. Not only because that's direct disobedience and defiance of what God's word says, not just out of the mouth of Peter, but out of the mouth of David in Psalm 55, saying the same thing out of the mouth of two witnesses, and I say this is a, a pretty good confirmation. Satan's well pleased when you hold on to those things that can distract and divide the soul, because then God does not have your 100% undivided attention, and Satan has the power and tools to manipulate you. What do you think about that? For me, I took another look at this verse and I said, you know, if I didn't know better, I have passed over something so good for so long. We have many promises in this church that we've, we've taught over the years, you've heard over and over again. This should be one of those now that you add with a full understanding of what's being said. I don't need to walk around anxious, the anxiety that comes, you, I'm sure you've all heard of an angina attack. We get that, by the way, it's, it's from the same root word, anxiety, angina, choking or squeezing off from the English etymology, the development of it. Choking off or squeezing the life out of us, just like the parable of the sower. 
So I would say a good place to start. If somebody says, well, tell me how it's possible then. You've laid out the groundwork and exposited the scripture. Tell me how it's possible. Hear how it's made possible. If you will take your anxieties, if you will take them to God, prayer and supplication, and one added dimension that without it, we know the life of faith and faithing are necessary. Prayer and supplication and the action of faith which is not just simply like Psalm 37, rolling off your burden per se and walking away, because the end of that, by the way, is it's always attractive to come back to that burden and look at it again and revisit the anxiety of what it was or get anxious again about the very thing you thought you were delivered from. But the finality of that verb which says, once it is thrust, go back to the pole vaulter, Pole vaulter must take that running. There is that small sprint. The pole must go in the ground. The runner thrusts themselves up over the bar. That is the order of the way it works, the progression of which is that running or leap of faith, the activity, prayer and supplication that lift it up, and then and not like the pole vaulter that ultimately falls on the mat, but this one is hurled up and left with him. It's left there. Lord, I trust you. I know that sounds terrible because how could I not trust him? But Lord, I trust you. Take it. You took away my sins. Take my anxieties too. Now, that is a hard, hard concept. When life keeps seemingly coming back and more and more care, if you will, more and more anxiety, and that's why I said there is an activity of all, not some, that lets you take this scripture and not only make it as instruction, but take it as something that is very golden, very great, which is he cares for you. It matters to him. Another translation in, I believe it was in the Spanish, and I think I wrote it down somewhere because it was so good for some that may have some trouble. They're calling uh, anxiety carga. And I immediately read the Spanish and said, cargo. That's what it is. So some of you who don't understand anxiety because you're trying to differentiate, it's your cargo. Dump it. That's the colloquial. That was the colloquial version, right? <laughs> Boy, you have a way of summarizing things. But I, I, I sometimes think we get the idea, or maybe other people get the idea, that Christians should all look like Atlas. With the world on your shoulders. By the way, for especially for you art people, he's not carrying the world. Go check it out. But it is the heavenlies, the celestial heavenlies. Still the same thing. You know, we've got to somehow carry it around. I'm reminded of the story in Amish country somewhere of a fellow who was by the roadside in one of those big back sacks, you know, the ones that has the tent and maybe the porta potty and everything. It's a big giant <laughs> thing by the side of the road. And it was an Amish farmer that picked him up in the horse and carriage. And he got in, sat beside the man, and he ha still had his backpack on. He said, aren't you going to take your backpack off? And he said, no, I don't want to bother. Well, the Amish man said, you might as well the whole carriage is carrying you. You might as well take a load off. That's how we are. We want God to, to carry us. Save me, Lord. Just don't take this baggage off my back because God forbid I should walk around realizing the fact that this weight that so, does so easily beset me and weigh me down, cast on you. You're already carrying me. It's no big deal for you to carry my anxieties too. Now, when you put that all in perspective, you see how... It is quite humbling to recognize that we're not able to get rid of. I don't care what any self-help person says. We're not able to get rid of it until we've brought it to him. And finally, to put all this together, because I said we, we did this in pieces, go back and look at my tablet now. I want you to look at the first word, all. All anxiety of you having thrown in an act that suggests you did it and you left it there upon him, not anybody else. Start there. Everything else is subordinate to him. Because 
To him, he cares, he sees you, he sees your issues. He knows what they are, but he wants you to bring them to him, and not just bring them, but that actual activity that is energized, thrusting to him, that says, I'm not taking it back now. It's gone. Because he cares about you. Maybe some of you think, there may be a few here that think you've been too bad in God's eyes to even qualify for this. There's no qualification. All, all are eligible for this. Maybe you think you failed too badly to put yourself under that canopy, then I would ask you frankly to look at who the writer is, the greatest failure chronicled for us in the New Testament, Peter, who can turn around and with great bold confidence say, this is the way, this is the instruction. Now, I can't make you uh, go through the activity, but I can tell you one thing, because I read your prayer requests, and I definitely know what happens. People will call in something, and a lot of you, you do that. I do it. I can't let go. I just can't let it go. Some of you, it's a son or a daughter. You're not willing to just let go. You've been trying and wrestling. There are some here. You've been trying and wrestling, and you finally think, I'm just going to keep going on this. Maybe it's time for you to really recognize this is where peace comes and maybe where God will finally enter in because you've been so anxious about it. The focus cannot be that he will do this work for you. So the call today, he knows your condition. He knows right where you are. If you'll take this scripture, really take it, not only as a nitro pill, I think this is something that needs to be put from our Lord's heart, right into ours today, that we might understand when we leave here, not even when we leave here, right now, as your mind may have been turning while I was talking about things may be pressing in, I pray not, but sometimes it's inevitable. You try to block it out, and here it comes again, and it takes over your mind, that you just say, I'm, I'm not just going to do this passively. I'm, I'm going to thrust it all, and I'm leaving it there. And Satan, you can't come back and revisit this again, because that's what, that is the other trick. Satan likes to come back and say, well, maybe God's not going to take care of it. After all, you can't see him. You don't know what he's doing. He's not visible right now. Who knows? Maybe he won't take care of it. Isn't that the voice that led Adam and Eve to fall, to doubt God's word? So I'm asking you today to act on his word. Take it, begin to pray about it, and let your burden, your anxiety, your care, bring it to the Lord and leave it there. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.